Hi. This one's titled, The Price to be Paid. Hebrews 10, verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. That's rather sad. That some people can actually embrace the faith and then because it gets a bit tough and the weeds grow and choke you out that you give it up. If any man shrink back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. We need to stand because the reward is great. We needn't give up. Here I am in London. And this is the great St. Paul's Cathedral. And uh, I'd been in St. Paul's Cathedral before, and it's in one of my previous lectures. There are incredible signs and wonders in that cathedral. And so I took all of those pictures, and they, they are in a previous lecture. Also Masonic symbols all over the place. Fascinating place. But when I was there this time, they were renovating it. And there was a long lineup or queue to get into this building. And I was wondering, what, what's going on? Why is there such a long lineup? I finally got somewhere close to the point and I saw you had to pay to go inside. Something like 10 pounds. That's a lot of money for a Southern African. That's 140 rand. That's the equivalent in spending capacity of $140 to someone living there and earning them in that currency. That was a lot of money. So I, I inquired, you know, why is it so expensive to go into this place? No, 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 no. They're, they're renovating the place and they need the funds. So it reminded me of St. Peter's Cathedral, <laughs> where they sold indulgences to renovate the place. Remember that? <laughs> and so when I got to the front of the queue, I said to the man, I would go in and pay the 10 pounds, but seeing that it is for the renovation of the cathedral, I would please want the indulgence to go with it. And uh, he wasn't amused. And I said to him, but you, you know, uh, your, your sister, no, not your sister, your mother, <laughs> they offered an indulgence and you're back there right now. You're all under one roof. Why can't I have an indulgence? And, and I, I'm always naughty. <laughs> anyway, he didn't give me an indulgence. I was most upset. Isn't it magnificent, this building? Totally refurbished, looking exactly like St. Peter's. And if you're going to pay for the renovation of St. Peter's, you might as well get an indulgence, I mean, please. It is a replica. It is an image of the beast. Fascinating. Protestantism has gone all the way. In 1887, Gratan Guinness wrote... Fifty years ago, the eminent statement Sir Robert Peel said with remarkable clear foresight. Now please consider, this is 120 years ago. The day is not distant and may be very near when we shall all have to fight the battle of the Reformation over again. I wonder what this person would write today. The day is far gone for people to stand up and fight the battle of the Reformation all over again. Then he writes, the day has come. So I guess in our time we have to say the day is gone. We're almost too late. More than three centuries of emancipation, what will he say after four? From the yoke of Rome, 300 years of Bible light and liberty had made us overconfident. And led us to underestimate the power and influence of the deadliest foe, not only of the gospel of God, but also of Protestant England. 
Britain's honorable distinction of being the leading witness amongst the nations for the truth of the gospel and against the errors of Romanism had come to be lightly esteemed amongst us. 120 years ago. Our fathers won this distinction through years of sore struggle and strife. They purchased it with their best blood and prized it as men prize that which costs them dear. It had cost us nothing. We were born to it. We knew not its value by contrast as they did. In the early part of this century, the power of Rome was in these lands a thing of the past. And it seemed to be fast decaying even in other lands. The notion grew up amongst us that there was no need to fear any revival of that deadly upas tree, which is the blight of all that is great and good and pure and prosperous. The light of the true knowledge had forever dispelled the dark fogs of superstition, so it was supposed. Medieval tyrannies and cruelties cloaked under a pretense of religion could never again obtain a footing in these lands of light and liberty. We might despise and deride the corruptions and follies of Rome, but as to dreading her influence, no. She was too far gone and too feeble to inspire fear or even watchfulness. Our reformed faith is thus endangered both from without and from within, and it can only be defended by a resolute return to the true witness borne by saints and martyrs of others' days. We must learn afresh from divine prophecy God's estimate of the character of the Church of Rome if we would be moved afresh to be witnesses for Christ as against this great apostasy. Interesting, eh? 120 years ago. I wonder what he would say today. Well, he's resting. 2 Peter 20 verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. If you were in darkness, that was one thing. But if you embrace the light and then you turn your back on the light, the latter end is worse than the beginning. Verse 21 says, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it happened to them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. The Bible is so cute, you know. Just takes it right there and says, this is what it is. If you've had light and you reject it, you're worse off than you were when you didn't have the light. In fact, the Bible says, seven demons worse than the first come back. And it's a nightmare. There's nothing worse than a really apostate Christian. Really nothing worse. I want to take you through a little bit of history. This is the Martyrs Memorial. And if I say the name Thomas Cranmer, how many people will raise their hands and say, I know that guy, I know exactly what he did. Anybody willing to? There is one or two maybe. What about Nicholas Ridley? What that man did. What about Hugh Latimer? Do people walk around talking about you, Latimer? Man, you know, remember you, Latimer? Nah, nah. Superman, they'll remember. Batman, maybe Davy Crockett. But Cranmer, Redley, Latimer, nah. They're forgotten. And that is why I decided I'm going to take this worldwide. These people may not be forgotten. We have to be reminded of what they did, what they stood for, because we're we going to have to do it again, maybe. Well, here's the Martyrs Memorial, Thomas Cranmer. And you can see these were not young gentlemen. They are 
depicted here as gray. And in Oxford, the students walk by and they see the spire and it's not so pretty anymore. The birds sit on it. Nobody really cares. Nobody knows what really happened there. And yet these were bishops of the Anglican Church. And Cranmer was the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was the head of the Anglican Church. His present-day equivalent would be Rowan Williams. So these were prominent people, and they were Protestants. Now, Ridley supported Lady Jane Grey's claim to the crown. And in 1553, shortly after the accession of the Catholic Mary I, he was imprisoned with Cranmer and Hugh Latimer. He took part in 1554 in the Oxford disputations against a group of Catholic theologians and would not recant his Protestant faith. You see, England had become Protestant. It was an amazing feat. An absolutely phenomenal change. The whole of England had converted to Protestantism. And after Henry VIII died, Lady Jane Grey was enthroned. And she just managed to hang in there for a couple of days and she was beheaded. Lady Jane Grey's execution. And Mary I ascended the throne. She had another rival, Elizabeth I. She threw her in a dungeon, took away her clothes, and the only thing she had was a Bible. Don't underestimate great Elizabeth I. The stories that we hear and that we see in the media and in the movies about Elizabeth I. There's another story to that tale which is very much untold these days. But I'm not going to talk about Elizabeth I. I'm going to talk about Mary I. She was known as Bloody Mary and it had nothing to do with vodka. But the color of the drink had something to do with it. Because the Bloody Mary is what? Vodka and tomato juice. Because that's the color of blood. And she caused more blood to flow than anyone would care to remember. Queen Mary I, known as Bloody Mary, she had this friendly disposition on her face, as you can see. And she had all Protestants of high position arrested, tried, many of them executed publicly. She burnt over 300 people publicly and thousands rotted in dungeons and died from hunger, starvation. She is not for nothing known as Bloody Mary. We read in the book The Great Controversy, about Hugh Latimer. He was an interesting man, an old man, an old bishop. Do you know, said Latimer, who is the most diligent bishop in England? I see you listening and harking that I should name him. I will tell you, it is the devil. <laughs> He's cute, then. He is never out of his diocese. You will never find him idle. Call him when you will. He is ever at home. He is ever at the plough. You shall never find him remiss, I warrant you, where the devil is resident. There, away with books and up with candles. Away with Bibles and up with beads. Away with the light of the gospel and up with the light of wax tapers. Yea, at noonday, down with Christ's cross. Up with the purgatory pick purse. You know, put the money in for indulgences. Away with clothing the naked, the poor, the impotent. Up with the decking of images and gay garnishing of stones and stocks. Down with God and his most holy word. Up with traditions, human counsels and a blinded pope. Oh, that our prelates would be as diligent to sow the corn of good doctrine as Satan is to sow the cockle and darnel. 
this is what these old bishops were like. They said it like it was. They were tough. They weren't scared to speak. But he paid for it. He paid with, for it with his life. And then on October 16, 1555, Bishop Ridley and Bishop Latimer were led to their martyrdom. Now this story is fascinating. Ridley came fully robed as he would be dressed as a bishop. Latimer wore a simple frieze frock. The 70-year-old Latimer followed feebly behind Ridley. Ridley gave his clothes away to those standing by. Latimer quietly stripped, stripped to his shroud. And though in his clothes he had appeared a withered, crooked old man, he now stood bolt upright and they were fastened to their stakes. Ridley's brother tied a bag of gunpowder to both of their necks. And then as a burning faggot was lighted at the feet of Ridley, Latimer cheered him with the words that will live in the memory of English Protestants, so long as history shall run. When I read that, I thought, oh, here we have a problem. People don't even know who Ridley was, let alone Latimer or any one of those. Well, if this is going to be remembered as long as history shall run, then somebody better do something about it. Now, what did he say? Here they are being tied to the stake and the people all around watching. And he said, Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. It's pretty tough, eh? You're going to your death. And they tied this gunpowder around them and they lighted those faggots and the wind came from the one side and Latimer was quickly dead. And Ridley stood. The wind from the wrong side. The faggots packed up high, choking out. No air, no oxygen coming through. And he smoldered, and he was charcoal up to his waist, and still alive. Can you imagine that? Then somebody realized what was going on eventually, and ripped some of the faggots away, and the, the air came in, and the fire took hold, and the gunpowder exploded, and Ridley died a horrendous death. Be of good cheer, Master Ridley, and play the man. And we shall by God's grace light such a candle in England as shall never go out. And Cranmer, he had been elected Archbishop of Canterbury by the Pope because England used to be Catholic. But then he converted to Protestantism. He couldn't be put to death because they had to wait for a note from the Pope to say that Cranmer could be sentenced to death as well. So they took Cranmer and they put him on top of the wall and they said, watch, your favorite bishops die. And he watched as Ridley suffered horrendously and he fainted. He fainted, couldn't handle it. And eventually when it was all over, they took him and they put him in the dungeon and they worked on him, and they worked on him, and they worked on him. And finally the old man cracked. And he signed a recantation. Interesting history. Cranma was not allowed to seal his fate with his life for another six months. For the Pope's ascent was sought to the burning of the prelate who had been consecrated while England still recognized the papal supremacy. The old man was induced more than once to give his enemies the opportunity of saying that he, once the leader amongst the Protestants of England, had recanted. Here's the good news. At last he saw his error and his old steadfastness was restored to him, revoking his recantation. He added, for as much as my hand offended, writing contrary to my heart, my hand shall be first punished, therefore, 
For may I come to the fire, it shall first be burned. And when he came to the stake on March the 21st, 1556, on the same spot where his friends Ridley and Latimer had suffered, he resolutely thrust his hand into the flames as they drew near him and was heard to say repeatedly, that unworthy right hand. History tells us he stuck his hand out and put them in the fire. And they burnt while he was alive until both his fingers dropped off. And he didn't move. He put them in the fire and he said, that unworthy hand, that unworthy right hand. Amazing stories. And nobody knows about Cranmer. And nobody knows about Latimer, and nobody knows about Ridley. And here is the spot where they were burnt today. There are big buildings there in Oxford. And here on this building, there's a little plaque, which nobody can even see what's on it, telling us where the spot was. And the students walked by, and the students walked by. And so I went and enlarged it this little bit, and it said, opposite this point, Near the cross in the middle of Broad Street, you Latimer, one time Bishop of Worcester, Nicholas Ridley, Bishop of London, and Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury, were burned for their faith in 1555, the two of them, and in 1556, Cranmer. Oh, I walked to the middle of the road, and there's the spot where he was burned, or they were burned. And the students walk by, and the students walk over the spot, and the bicycles ride by, and the bicycles drive over the spot. And nobody knows what happened there. They haven't got a clue. They haven't got a clue. Cranmer's story needs more elaboration. 1539. Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, hired Miles Coverdale. This is when he was still in control and the Protestant bishop. At the bequest of King Henry VIII to publish the Great Bible. It became the first English Bible authorized for public use as it was distributed to every church. Chained to the pulpit and a reader was even provided so that the illiterate could hear the word of God in plain English. So this archbishop said, put the Bible in every church and let everybody read it. And if you can't read it, I'll supply someone to read it for you. Isn't that fantastic? That's what Ezra the scribe did when they rediscovered the word. He had it read to the people. And Cranmer did exactly the same thing. It would seem that William Tyndall's last witch had, wish had been granted. And William Tyndall, how did he write that Bible? As a fugitive, God's rebel, God's fugitive, always on the run, always changing his address, writing the Bible, brilliant scholar. You think Shakespeare was responsible for the magnificence of the English language? Forget it. He got it from Tyndall and the Bible. And here they were, and Tyndall was strangled and then burned. Just three years after his martyrdom, Cranmer's Bible, published by Coverdale, was known as the Great Bible due to its great size, a large pulpit folio measuring over 14 inches tall. Seven editions of this version were published between April 1539 and December 1541. Well, let's go to this little place over here in Oxford. This is the Church of St. Mary's. And this is where they dragged Cranmer when he recanted. Now, he used to be a Catholic, had become a Protestant, and now he was just nobody. And he had recanted. But they weren't going to put him on the pulpit. No, that's too high and exalted. But he wanted them, they wanted him to tell the people that he had recanted. 
So what to do? Can't put him on the pulpit? Then he's too high? Can't have him standing on the floor? Nobody can see who's speaking? Everything is on one level? So what they do? They chop the little piece out of the pillar, put a, a, a chair or something there, and a plank over it, leaning on the pillar, and there, and there he stood. And he had to make his little speech of recantation. Let me take you into that cathedral. There it is. Today it is, of course, again a Protestant. Uh, let me correct that. And it's supposedly Protestant cathedral. And this is what it looks like today. And there's some interesting plaques over here on the wall. And some of the history is written over here. And uh, it says there on one of the plaques, the Archbishop Cranmer and Bishop Ridley and Latimer were twice tried for heresy in St. Mary's Church during Catholic Queen Mary's attempt to reverse the Reformation. Ridley and Latimer were burned at the stake, 1555. Cranmer recanted. In 1556, he was again brought to St. Mary's. This pillar, this is the plaque on the pillar, had been cut away to allow the building of a low platform from which he was to make his submissions. At the last moment, the man stood there on this plank. He saw his former congregation and something happened in him. At the last moment, he withdrew his recantation. He walked from the church to the fire with a firm step and a smiling countenance, putting first into the flame the hand which had signed the recantation. And there is the piece of the pillar that they chopped out. And there they put this plank. And they said, you stand on them and tell them that you have recanted from your Protestant faith. And he made a speech. Fantastic speech. Let's read it. These are the words he wrote. For as much as I am to the last end of my life, whereupon all hangeth of my life past and my life to come, either to live with my master Christ forever in joy, or else to be in pain forever with wicked devils in hell, and I see before mine eyes presently either heaven ready to receive me, or hell ready to swallow me up. I shall therefore declare unto you my very faith, how I believe, without any color or dissimulation. For now is no time to dissemble whatsoever I had said or written in times past. Well, that actually assured him that the queen would forgive him if he just made this recantation. She'd actually said, Her Majesty will have Cranmer a Catholic, or she will have no Cranmer at all. Interesting. Well, we don't have to read everything he says. We'll read it in a moment. Between 9 and 10 o'clock, March 21, 1556, he was led forth to be burned in the place where his friends had suffered. While he was hurried to the stake, he declared, on his way, and as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and Antichrist with all his false doctrines. His sufferings were short as the fire soon blazed fiercely. Continuing his speech. Having briefly expressed the chief articles of his faith, he referred to his previous recantation, and he said, And now I come to the great thing that so much troubleth my conscience, more than anything I ever did or said in my whole life, and that is the setting, forth, the setting abroad of a writing contrary to the truth, which now here I renounce and refuse as things written with my hand, contrary to the truth which I thought in my heart, and which was written for fear of death and to save my life if it might be. And that is all such bills and papers which I have written or signed with my hand since my degradation, when I have written many things untrue and for as much as my hand offended, writing contrary to my heart. My hand shall first be punished therefore, for may I come to the fire, it shall be burnt. And as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy, and Antichrist with all his false doctrines. So these were the great Oxford martyrs, these three. On uttering this, Cranmer was pulled down from the stage and led to the fire. Having put off his outer garments, he stood there in a shirt, hung down to his feet. His beard was long and thick and covered his bosom. 
And then with an iron chain tied about him, the fire said to the faggots. When these were kindled and the fire began to burn near him, stretching out his arm, he put his right hand into the flame, holding it there immovable. Thus did he stand, moving no more than the stake to which he was bound. His eyes were lifted to heaven, and often he repeated, Thus right hand has offended, O oh, this unworthy right hand. At last, in the greatness of the flame, he cried, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, and gave up the ghost. These people were tough. They stood for something. Well, let's go back to this church. This is the church where Protestantism actually flourished and took hold. And here's another little plaque on that pillar. And this is a plaque to John Henry Newman. Now let's jump 300 years, almost 300 years into the future. So less than 300 years. 1833. John Kebble preached from the pulpit in a size sermon which is said to have initiated the Oxford movement. Under his influence, and that of Edward Pusey and John Newman, vicars of St. Mary, from 1828. The church became the center of the Tractarians' attempt to revive spiritual life of the church and the university. Now let's see what this revival was about. With more frequent celebrations of the Eucharist and a generally more Catholic theology. So it took less than 300 years to turn the Reformation upside down. Newman drew huge congregations to hear him preach, as Matthew Arnold wrote, who could resist the charm of that spiritual apparition gliding in the dim afternoon light through the aisles of St. Mary's, rising into the pulpit, and then in the most entrancing of voices, breaking the silence with words and thoughts which were a religious movement, subtle, sweet, and mournful. And he turned that whole stage upside down. And Britain lost its Protestantism. Well, here is the church. Here is the altar. The altar is back. They wrote then, if you see an altar, run. We don't need an altar. We had an altar. Christ has been sacrificed. No need for an altar in a church. And here above the altar, the saints and Mary and candles and the whole catastrophe. Everything is back. There she is in the middle. And all the pictures and all the venerations back. And here's a little commemorative plaque. So I went, I went through that cathedral with a magnifying glass, found this little plaque, photographed it. There it is. It's illegible, so I wrote it for you. The figures of the saints above the high altar were restored by the Anglo-Catholic Congress to commemorate the centenary of the Oxford movement and to keep in honored memory its leaders, especially John Kebble, professor of poetry, John Henry Newman, fellow of Oriel College and sometime vicar of this church, Richard Harrell Froud, fellow of the Oriel College, Edward Bouveret Pusey, regress professor of Hebrew. Let us now praise famous men and our fathers who begat us. Good grief. 14 July 1833 to 14 July 1933. And then Newman, once he had established this tremendous Catholic revival, walked out of the Anglican Church and joined the Catholic Church. Oh, the Te Deum bells rang and the Pope rejoiced. And the music in the Vatican was unheard of. And the Pope welcomed him into the arms of the Catholic Church and made him a cardinal. And he became Cardinal Newman. And upon his death, he was, of course, immediately sainted. No, he wasn't. But they're doing it now. Oh, yes, they are commemorating the victory over Protestantism. And Cardinal Newman 
who will be a saint and you can pray to him and get some absolution from his extreme dignity. How far will these people go? Let's have a look at it. CNA Catholic News Agency. Cardinal Newman beatification hoped for this year as saint guidelines tighten. Vatican City, January 11, 2008. Cardinal Henry, John Henry Newman, the famous 19th century British convert to Catholicism, could be beatified this year even as Pope Benedict tightens the guidelines for canonization. The Daily Telegraph reports on Tuesday, CNA reported that Cardinal Joe Sarah Martin told the Vatican newspaper, La Osservatario Romano, that Cardinal Newman's beatification was imminent. Now he has given an even more specific time frame, telling the Daily Telegraph that he hoped the beatification would happen this year. Oh, excitement. Cardinal Newman, a prominent cleric in the Anglican Church, caused great controversy when he converted to Catholicism in 1845. His defense of Catholic beliefs was remarkable for Victorian England, and his explanations of the development of Christian doctrine continued to be very influential. He died in 1890. And now what they're doing with him? I don't believe this. Catholic Online. Cardinal Newman's bones to be removed for veneration. When was this? The eighth month, the 15th day, 2008. That's just the other week. The Catholic Herald, these will be most likely be bones from his hands, which will be shared out between key churches in Britain. Hmm, exciting. As well as one being sent to the Vatican. London, the Catholic Herod, bones are be removed from the body of Cardinal John Henry Newman so that they can be venerated as holy relics. The government has granted a license permitting undertaking to dig up the body of Cardinal Newman more than a century after his death. What is Rome celebrating by doing this right now? They are celebrating the destruction of Protestantism. And my prayer is that the prayers of those dying people will not be forgotten as they stood in those flames, but that there will be a new resistance such as the world has never seen. And that the beast and his dragon lord may be so stunned and surprised that he won't even know what hit him. Officials from the Ministry of Justice have also given the go-ahead for Catholic experts in holy objects to fly in from Italy to retrieve major relics from the corpse after the coffin is opened for the first time. They should send holograms. Just think of all that carbon emission they're going to produce to get hold of a little finger or something from the hand of Cardinal Newman. Isn't this pathetic? In this day and age, this is blatant rubbing the nose of Protestantism in the quagmire of lies. Well, I want to take you to Smithfield. This is where Queen Mary managed to burn over 300 martyrs. And you go to Smithfield and you see, oh, here's a big station. There's nothing. You really have to look. You walk past this building, here's a little plaque. Tiny little plaque. West Smithfield, EC1. Smithfield Station. There it is. This is what you see. There's no memorial. There's nothing. Absolutely nothing. Just a little plaque against the wall. And you can't even read it, it's behind a bar, there you can see it. And there's a tiny little plaque which I took a separate picture of and enlarged it so that you don't need a magnifying glass to read it. And it said, it erected 1870 by the Protestant Alliance London. And then there's got a couple of names here. Within this, 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 whatever, John Rogers, John Bradford, and it's got a couple of names there, and that's it. 
Nobody has the foggiest idea what's going on here. What happened to these people? They died here. They were burnt for their faith. Who is this John Rogers? Have you heard of John Rogers? Who's heard of John Rogers? Nobody. Well, let me tell you who John Rogers was. So we've had Cranmer, we've had Ridley, we have Latimer, and now let's have Rogers. He had been an associate of Tyndall, so we owe him a debt of gratitude. And Coverdale in the translation of the scriptures into English. If it weren't for Rogers, Coverdale, and Tyndall, remember they murdered Tyndall before he even finished his work. Thanks to these people, we have a Bible in English. The crime for which he was led to the stake at Smithfield on February the 14th, 1555, was the denial of transubstantiation. I just want you to realize what these people were prepared to die for. Transubstantiation. He refused to acknowledge that that wafer bread is a sacrifice and becomes the body of Christ, the literal body of Christ. Christ was sacrificed once for all, and he would not accept that. Death, said Queen Mary. A pardon was offered him if he would but recant. That's all you have to do. Say this little piece of bread is the body, really, literally, and substantially, and you can walk out of the flames. Let's see what the man said. A pardon was offered him if he would but recant when the faggots were already heaped about him. His answer? That which I have preached, said Rogers, will I seal with my blood. Thou art a heretic, said the sheriff. That shall be known at the last day, said Rogers. Was the undaunted answer of the martyr, and the pardon was exchanged for the torch. With hands raised towards heaven until they fell into the flames, the proto-martyr of England's saddest period of persecution passed through the flames. We have no idea the price that these martyrs paid for what they did. As I was walking around Smithfield, I was looking, what else is there? What else can I find? Ah, here's a little church. Welcome to the Priory Church of St. Bartholomew. And I wanted to know, it was founded in 1123, so that's in the Catholic period, and it exists today, so it became Protestant. I went inside. I went and found the rector's Bateman book with all the registry of what happened in this church. And I was not allowed to take it because the man was very adamant. So I page, 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 page. Oh, and my eye caught this interesting page. And it says over here that Wesley got back to London and Wesley first preached here According to his journal on Sunday morning, the 24th of December, 1738. So Wesley, one of the great Protestant leaders, founder of Methodism, he preached in this church. A fine Protestant sermon I can imagine. So I went inside. This is what it looks like. Nice squares on the floor. Nice building, and then I went to the notice board, oh, and it says, All Saints' Day, the Holy Eucharist. What did Rogers just die for? For this very thing, and there it is, rubbing it into the nose, let's put it in there, the Holy Eucharist, requiem mass. Mm. Fascinating. Wine reception. A hideous picture of a naked Christ, an altar which is holy, the candles, the whole Catholic bit, from you name it to you name it. Oh, we forgot the icons, the Mary and the child, the crucifixes, everything is back. There is no semblance of Protestantism. This writer says, it is not without reason that the claim has been put forth that Catholicism is now almost like Protestantism. 
There has been a change, but the change is in Protestants, not in Romanists. Catholicism indeed resembles the Protestantism that now exists, but it is far removed from the Protestantism as it was in the days of Cranmer, Ridley, Knox, and other reformers. As the Protestant churches have been seeking the favor of the world, false charity has blinded their eyes. They do not see but that it is right to believe good of all evil, and as the inevitable result, they will finally believe evil of all good. Instead of standing in defense of the faith once delivered to the saints, they are now, as it were, apologizing to Rome for their uncharitable opinion of her, begging pardon for her bigotry. If you cleanse the house and you accept the beautiful message of salvation in Christ and then you return to this idol idolatry, you are seven times worse off than you were in the beginning. Protestantism today is finished. Times Online, 2007. Pope to discuss influx of Anglicans. The Pope will discuss how to deal with the increasing numbers of requests from disaffected Anglicans to join the Roman Catholic Church at a meeting with cardinals from around the world tomorrow. Pope Benedict, who is making the reunification of Christendom a goal of his pontificate, is in talks with at least three U.S. Episcopal bishops about their reception into the Catholic Church. He has also been approached by an entire breakaway group of traditionalist Anglicans about admitting them to his church. Other churches are no sisters of ours, the Vatican insists. We are the mother of all the churches. And I will not suffer loss of children. My children shall return. And here they go slouching back to mummy. Forgetting all that they once stood for and were prepared to die for? Pope's assertion of primacy, a problem for Protestants. An appeal by Pope Benedict for non-Catholic Christians to recognize papal primacy risks reinforcing divisions between churches. They know where they are. That's why they're so blatant. They don't care. The Pope says, Peter's responsibility thus consists of guaranteeing the communion with Christ, said Benedict. Let us pray so that the primacy of Peter, entrusted to mega rich, I mean, sorry, poor human beings, may always be exercised in this original sense, desired by the Lord, so that it will be increasingly recognized in its true meaning by brothers who are still not in communion with us. The world seen from Rome. Benedict highlights first century papal primacy, begins audience series on apostolic fathers. The church is above all a gift of God and not a creature of ours, the Pope contended, and therefore this sacramental structure not only guarantees the common order, but the precedence of the gift of God that we all need. What an arrogance. His primacy is a sacrament. Do you know what a sacrament is? A sacrament, according to Catholic doctrine, is something which imparts merit. So if you accept the Pope, then you have merit, which allows you to go to heaven. It is a gift of God that he is accepted as the head of all the churches. This is a blasphemy beyond all blasphemies. And I want you to take you to this part of the British Isles. This is Scotland. And I want to tell you why it is a blasphemy. This is Edinburgh in the background there. Hey, the Scots, the Scots, there somewhere, there it is. Taken from high up. And there we go. This is Edinburgh. One of the seats of the Reformation. Powerful story here. Interesting what we see in Edinburgh. There's, of course, the famous Friars Bobby. The tribute to the affectionate fidelity of Grey Friars Bobby. 
In 1858, this faithful dog followed the remains of his master to Greyfriars Churchyard and lingered near the spot until his death in 1872. Can you imagine that? All those years, from 58 to 72, this dog lay every day on his master's grave. Absolutely faithful. This is the graveside, grave fry, friar's body, body, Bobby. And it says here, died 14th January 1872, aged 16 years. Let his loyalty and devotion be a lesson to us all. A dog can be faithful. But we can't. We can't. Here is the Church of Scotland, known as the Highland Kirk. Kirk is church in Scottish. And this is Greyfriars Churchyard, where old Bobby lies. But there's more to Greyfriars Churchyard than just Bobby. You walk through that churchyard, and you walk past these old dilapidated memorial beacons, and you try and read what it says on there. And this is what you see. It's very hard to read. It talks here about the book of Revelation and the martyrs under the altar crying out to God and saying, How long, Lord, how long before you avenge the blood of your martyrs? And here is this plaque, virtually impossible to read. So I wrote it out for you. And this is what it says. Halt, passenger, take heed what you see. This tomb does show for what some men did die. Here lies interred the dust of those who stood against perjury, resisting unto blood, adhering to the covenants and laws establishing the same, which was the cause their lives were sacrificed unto the lusts of prelates abjured. So all these priests, Though here their dust lies mixed with murderers and other crew whom justice justly did to death pursue. But as for them, no cause was found worthy of death, but only they were found constant and steadfast, zealous, witnessing for the prerogatives of Christ their King. Which truth were sealed by famous Guthrie's head, and all along to Mr. Renwick's blood they did endure his wrath of enemies, reproaches, torments, deaths, and injuries. But yet they are those who from such trouble came and now triumph in glory with the Lamb. From May 27th, 1661, that the most noble Marquis of Argyle was beheaded to the 17th of February, 1688. We're talking here of a very short period of time, just over 20 years, 27 years, that Mr. James Ringwick suffered, were one way or other murdered and destroyed for the same cause about 18,000. One eight thousand for whom were executed at Edinburgh about 100 noblemen amongst them, gentlemen, ministers, and others, noble martyrs for Jesus Christ, the most of them lie here. 18,000 people slaughtered to death for what they stood for. Wow, this is incredible. What did they stand for? Why did 18,000 of them have to die? Because here was a war to regain political clout. And the kings that ruled in this time in England and over Scotland were clandestine Catholics. And they converted on their deathbeds to Catholicism. And they tried to destroy the Protestantism of Scotland. And there was war between England and Scotland over this issue. Here in this church, the covenant was signed. Here was signed the National Covenant 1638. And these kings from England said, you will acknowledge me now, the king of England, as head of the church. These clandestine Catholics in disguise. And what did the Scots say? Never. 
We have one king, and that is Jesus Christ. You will not be head of the church. We will not exchange a pope for a king. We have a king. His name is Jesus Christ. 18,000. War after war. The wars between Britain and Scotland were religious wars over the supremacy of Christ. And Scotland was crushed. It was crushed. Here's the signing of the covenant in Greyfriars Churchyard. Here the people said, So far and no further we have one king and he is Christ Jesus and we will not accept a Catholicizing even if a supposed king is going to take the place of the Pope. And the covenant was signed. And here is the place where most of them died. They herded them into this spot over here behind this gate. And here in Greyfriars Kirkyard, the covenanter's prison can be found. And then they took them out one by one to go and burn them at the stake in Edinburgh. But it was freezing cold. It was the middle of winter. They had no food. They had no warm clothing. There were thousands of them herded into this little spot over here. And most of them f froze to death. And the little children froze first because they didn't make a distinction between children and women. And this is what the army used to sing as they marched against Britain, England. And this is what they sang. When the kirk, the church, we come, we'll purge it ilka room, we'll purge every room, fray from popish relics, we'll free it from the popish relics, and all such innovations that the world may see there's nane, none in the right but we, of the old Scottish nation. This is what they marched. They marched and they sang this as they marched. We'll purge this place from your Catholicism and your icons and all your stuff. We stand for this and we will not be crushed played by the Scots army when it marched into England under Alexander Leslie, Earl of Leven, 1640, 26,000 strong. These are incredible wars. We don't see these features in the movies that they make today to commemorate these great events, Braveheart and what they were all called, these movies. This is the spot where they burnt them. There's a commemorative place here, and I went there, and I took a look at this, and I said, wow, this is fascinating. And here it stands, that here they were burnt to death for their faith, on this spot. And while we were taking photographs of this spot, the modern generation, now remember, what generation is this? This is the heritage of Protestantism, what's left over comes marching by on this very spot, and they mocked us. Oh, but I'm not easily mocked, so I had a nice conversation with them. I started hmm, chatting to them. Well, they made some nasty signs. I've got the pictures of them, but I won't show you those. Here's a little plaque uh, which says that here the covenanters and some of them were murdered. And this is the new generation of Scots. And I looked at them, and I thought to myself, well, what is this? And I said, do you mind if I take a picture of you? And the first pictures that I took, they all had filthy signs in them, so I couldn't show them. But I managed to take this one when they calmed down. These people are so high, they don't know even how high they are. And uh, I looked at them, and the thoughts that went through my mind were this. What a cry for help. Isn't this a cry for help? This is a cry for help. This is a world of emptiness, robbed of any meaning. And this is the heritage of Protestantism. Their fathers and great-grandfathers and great-great-grandfathers died in their thousands for something worthy of belief and faith. And they've been robbed, and they've been given nothing in return. 
and this is what they look like. And my heart went out to them. And I said, oh God, let this message revive so that the soul of man can be given back to them. You walk around this place, what do you see? Tattoo. This is the exact spot, the exact street. I just walked in an area the size of this hall around it. This is what you see. Tattoo. Deadhead comics. Venus fly trap tattoo. One tattoo place after the other. Disgusting pictures of demonology. The witchcraft shop. All in an area around this memorial. Satan is really rubbing it in that he believes that he has destroyed the Reformation. 1 Samuel 15, 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So here we are in this world today where all this blood flowed for nothing. Here is a mega church and in this a great reformer preached, the one who said, Give me Scotland, Lord, or I die. John Knox preached here. And I want to tell you this interesting story. This little lady over here depicted throwing this chair. 1637. The Jenny Geddes incident in St. Giles leads to the creation of the National Covenant. Okay, what happened there? This lady... She comes to the church. The church is just an open place. There are no pews in those days. And so they bring their little stools with them. And they sit on their stools and they listen to the sermon. And what did they try in Scotland in 1637? Well, this clandestine Catholic king, who was a Protestant, pre pretending to be a Protestant, he wants to change the order of things in Scotland. And so he wants to have a more Catholic liturgy. And so they start coming in and saying, we have to do things differently. And he puts up his Catholic prelates and they want to introduce the Mass. In Scotland. Not with Jenny Geddes there. Uh, Ah, no way. She says, what do you think you're doing in my kirk? And she takes this chair and she chucks it at him. <laughs> and the whole church grabs their chairs and those people just got out of there by in the nick of time. So here is the incidence as it is depicted and these prelates running for their lives out the back door. Don't mess with Jenny Geddes when you come to this nonsense. And here you have a statue of John Knox in there. And uh, this is what it looks like inside. And here lies actu actually Archibald Campbell. And he was the head of the Covenanters. And there he lies, martyred. You walk through the streets of Edinburgh, you find the John Knox Museum. And in it they depict this great confrontation between John Knox and Mary, Queen of Scots, not the same Mary, as Bloody Mary, this is another Mary, she was later executed for high treason by Elizabeth I. Interesting history. History is fascinating. You know, when you put it into context with this war between good and evil, and she said, Janax, you will not preach this Protestant rubbish in my country. And John Knox goes and he says, Madam, Let's look at this, what they, their conversation. Mary says, Ye are not the kirk that I will nourish and I will defend the kirk of Rome, for I think it is the true kirk of God. And Knox looks at her. Now, imagine this. He, he's looking at the queen who can put him to death just like that. He didn't flinch. He said, Your will, madam, is no reason, neither does your thought make that Roman harlot to be the true and immaculate spouse of Jesus Christ. He didn't mince his words. These people were tough. They had stood for something. What do they look today? What do they look like today? Washed out punks, veins full of drugs, 
Not even knowing where they're going, let alone where they come from. And when it came to standing up for what is right, and people said, you know, you know, John, it says here in the Bible that you should obey your governments. Yes, but when it comes to a choice between obeying your government and obeying the law of God, then we can come to a conflict. He says, true it is that God has commanded kings to be obeyed, but like true it is that in things which they commit against his glory, or when cruelly without cause they rage against their brethren, the members of Christ's body, he has commanded no obedience, rather he has approved, yea, and greatly rewarded such as have opposed them to their ungodly commandments and blind rage. These people weren't sissies. They stood for what they stood for. And here it says on this plaque, John Knox was one of the most radical political thinkers amongst the European reformers. In justifying revolution against an unjust or godly ruler, Knox was shaking the foundation of authority in Europe. They actually misdepict him. He wasn't like that at all. This is his, one of his last words. Rendering my troubled and sorrowful spirit in the hands of the eternal God, earnestly trusting at his good pleasure to be freed from the cares of this miserable life and to rest with Christ Jesus, my only hope and life. A prayer of John Knox. These people preach the gospel. Well, as you walk through this museum of John Knox, you get into another foyer and, whoa, everything changes. You have King Arthur's legend, and you have the stories here of King Arthur and all the round table stuff. And St. Columba and St. Magnus and how they came and restored Catholicism and how Catholicism battled and all of these issues. Moreover, Protestantism, priceless as have been the benefits it has conferred on those, says Kratan Guinness, of those who joined its ranks, is yet very far from being a perfect recovery of primitive Christianity. It has risen out of the gross ignorance and superstition of medieval Romanism. It has altogether abandoned the idolatry of image worship. Has it? No, it's brought it all back again. The Protestant churches are now preaching iconography, how we can relate to the icons. Everything is back. We're Roman Catholic. Virgin worship, saint worship, adoration of the priest-made wafer deity of the Latin Mass, everything is back. Even the Methodists have asked for common communion to eat the wafer god. Reminds me of my days when I converted and I stood in that Catholic church and I had a horrendous situation in my life. And I spoke to that host. I was Roman Catholic. And the little red light was burning and I knew the host, the consecrated host is there. And I talked and I talked and I talked and I talked to this host. And I realized, but he's dead. He's a wafer. He's a wafer. He cannot speak to me. I'm talking to a dead God. And I walked out of that church and I realized we serve a living God, not a dead God. It has recovered a purer faith and a simpler ritual, secured for the church a measure of liberty and independence. Above all, it has circulated the scriptures and the vulgar tongues. You all have Bibles. So let's not say the Reformation achieved nothing. Of the nations of Christendom and has adopted it as its motto, the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. People might as well not have the Bible today because they don't believe the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. But it has never completely purified itself from Romish doctrine and practice. It has never regained complete independence of secular domination. It has never got clear of union with the world. The Scots died in their droves fighting these battles. It has rejected the claim of the church to rule the state. It has not as clearly refused the pretensions of the state to rule the church. It has suffered worldly ambition, priestcraft, simony, and abuses of many kinds. You know what simony is? It comes from Simon Magus, 
who tried to buy the gifts of God. That's what we do these days. We try and buy the gifts of God. It has suffered worldly ambition, priestcraft, simony, abuses of many kinds, and it has developed two strong tendencies. One to return to the Romish apostasy, and the other to rationalism and infidelity. This man is spot on, 120 years ago. The true spiritual church of Christ is still even in Protestant lands, but a small part of the professing church. I want you to clearly bear in mind from the outset then that at first, that in point of time, Protestantism is a late or modern movement. Secondly, that it is in point of sphere a limited one. And thirdly, that it is in point of character a very imperfect return to primitive Christianity. We need to rectify that. Let's get back to primitive Christianity. If we don't have the faith of Cranmer and Latimer and Ridley and Rogers and Knox, we will not make it at the end. We need that faith and we need it now. All who in that evil day would fearlessly serve God according to the dictates of conscience will need courage, firmness, a knowledge of God and His Word. For those who are true to God will be persecuted, their motives will be impugned, their best efforts misinterpreted, and their names cast out as evil. Are you ready for it? Are you ready to pay this price? Satan will work with all his deceptive power to influence the heart and becloud the understanding. Have you seen it? Have you walked through the streets of Edinburgh? And there where once faith flourished and people were prepared to die for it, there's nothing but a broken piece of humanity left. To make evil appear good and good evil, the stronger and purer the faith of God's people, and the firmer their determination to obey Him, the more fiercely will Satan strive to stir up against them the rage of those while claiming to be righteous, trample upon the law of God. It will require the firmest trust, the most heroic purpose to hold fast the faith once delivered to the saints. I agree with this writer. Through the ages that have passed since the days of the apostles, the building of God's temple has never ceased. We may look back through the centuries and see the living stones of which it is composed gleaming like jets of light through the darkness of error and superstition. Who are those gleaming stones, the Pauls. How many of the disciples of Christ died a natural death? One. And he was cast into boiling oil and preserved by a miracle in order to die a natural death. All of them died. Paul was beheaded. Peter crucified upside down. The trail of blood from the time of Christ to the day in which we live will never be understood until we come to heaven one day. And if you think that the terrible things that happened under the communist regimes and the Mao Zedongs of this world were not instigated by these same powers, then I would want you to study history again. Throughout eternity, these precious jewels will shine with increasing luster, testifying to the power of the truth of God. The flashing light of these polished stones reveals the strong contrast between light and darkness, between the gold of truth and the dross of error. Paul and the other apostles, all the righteous who have lived since then, have acted their part in building of the temple, but the structure is not yet complete. If you want to be part of the stones, you must be able to take the heat. We who are living in this age have a work to do, a part to act. We are to bring to the foundation material that will stand the test of fire, gold, silver, and precious stone, polished after the similitude of a palace, Psalms 144, verse 12. To those who thus build for God, Paul speaks words of encouragement. If any man's work abide, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. The Christian who faithfully presents the word of life, 
leading men and women into the way of holiness and peace. He's bringing to the foundation materials that will endure. And in the kingdom of God, he will be honored as a wise builder. I would appeal at the end of the series for a new reformation, a powerful reformation, a return to primitive godliness such as the world has not seen since its inception. Because why should the world end with less of a manifestation of the glory of God than it began? Are we going to go out with a whimper? Or are we going to stand like Cranmer? God desired his people to prepare for the soon coming of crisis. Prepared or unprepared, they must all meet it. And those only who have brought their lives into conformity to the divine standard will stand firm at that time of test and trial. It is right upon us. When secular rulers unite with ministers of religion to dictate in matters of conscience, and we're seeing it more and more and more, then it will be seen who really fear and serve God. If I could tell you what's happening behind the scenes, even in my own life, your hairs would stand on edge. Do you think it's acceptable to the rulers to preach a message like this? That I'm still doing it is a miracle. When the darkness is deepest, the light of a godlike character will shine the brightest. When every other trust fails, then it will be seen who have an abiding trust in Jehovah. And while the enemies of truth are on every side watching the Lord's servants for evil, God will watch over them for good. You don't have to be afraid. He will be to them as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. We have lost sight of our faith. We are running along with this cauldron to the precipice. Luke 18 verse 8 says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on earth? I pray that he will. And I pray that every single one of you will be there to testify to this, irrespective of whether they build faggots or whatever they try. The Lord said to the church in Smyrna, Revelation 2.10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Christianity is not for sissies. 1 Peter 1, seven that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, may it be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, what does it say there? Having not seen ye love, not seen in some meditative illusionist prayer and touched and smelt and listened to, whom ye have not ye seen ye love, by faith, in whom there now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. Gird up your loins of your mind. Be sober. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're in the home stretch. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance, we need a repentance. We need a reformation. If we don't have a restoration and a reformation and a change of heart, we will be swept away. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Hebrews 10, 38, I started with this text, I'll end with it. Now the just shall live by faith, not by hocus pocus. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. May the God of all grace keep us. I don't know if I will ever see you again. But I hope to see you in heaven on the sea of glass. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, the times that the prophets spoke about are here. The walls are closing in. Our opportunities are few. few. 
We will have to do in a time of great trouble what we failed to do in a time of great prosperity. But I pray that you will strengthen the weak knees, that you will raise us up to stand like the Cranmers and the Ridleys and the Latimers, and if need be to the point of death, but you have promised, Lord, that you will neither leave us nor forsake us. That not a hair will be lost without you having counted it. You have put all our tears in a bottle, Lord. And you have brought them before you in remembrance. As we depart now from these meetings, I pray for everyone in this audience to stand for truth and righteousness in this crooked world. In Jesus' name, 